Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, the Red Raiders hit the road to travel to Ames, Iowa. But will it be with or without Warren Washington? We're into it next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, always free and available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. And today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers joining today, you're getting $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of five bucks or more wins. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started with the only Chris level. I'm Casey Cowan. Chris, great to be back with you, my man, wrapping up a week, getting ready for the weekend as the Red Raiders are back on the road. We'll get to their trip to Iowa State to take on the Cyclones. What else is going down in the Big 12 Conference? And also, we'll get to Texas Tech apparently finding the man that will lead the offensive line moving forward under Joey McGuire. But let's begin at Hilton Coliseum, Hilton Magic, it is a thing. We talked about some of the most intimidating environments in the Big 12 Conference uh, a week ago. Iowa State ranks very high on the list. Good or bad, they show up to support the Cyclones there in Ames. So Texas Tech obviously going to have their hands full. And uh, something you mentioned to me this week that was kind of interesting about this mount- matchup outside the lines, uh, potentially a matchup of two Coach of the Year candidates in the Big 12 Conference. I mean, I, I I really think that is the case. I think these two, uh, you know, I think Grant and and Coach Otzelberger are are right now the leaders in in that race. Some people won't care about that, but again, I think it goes back to look, you know, Kansas expected to do well. They were number one in the country preseason. They have not, you know, met that uh, with a lot of recent road losses. One in particular this past Monday. Um, and then, you know, Baylor has not probably been quite as consistent or good as, as maybe some have thought they've been good, but there's no like great job being done there. And then I think Houston was expected to do well and they have, I think Iowa state and, and Texas tech are two teams that there wasn't necessarily this expectation here, but they've exceeded whatever really by far with what most thought would be. And, you know, I don't think anybody thought Texas Tech would be just right there hanging at the, you know, at the top of the league standings with seven games to play, I guess it is. And Iowa State's a top 10-ish team that a lot of people think could go to the Final Four. And these two meet. They've known each other for a while. Uh, but I just think that when you start looking at it from that, you know, in, in that way or that prism, I, I just, yeah, I, I think these two are really – easily leading candidates for for something like that and again we still have a long way to go and uh and all that and it'll it'll bear out because like say if iowa state were to if they were to win if they were to beat the red raiders on saturday and then turn right around and beat houston on uh monday which would mean they swept houston that really seals up that race i think for tg Hauselberger. but it, it you get close to like kind of you know, wrapping up the league or getting or getting close to being able to do that uh, with with tiebreakers and all the all the things that you've done because you've beaten all these teams at the top of the standings. So anyway, uh, but yeah, that's uh, I, I think it's a credit to, to Grant and TJ for sure. Yeah, it kind of depends, I guess, on what type of criteria uh, those right. selecting these coaches are uh, prioritizing. Obviously, Kelvin Sampson's done a great job there. Do you anticipate a guy doing that? What does that mean to you versus someone maybe – uh, coming out of left field, obviously being a new member in the Big 12 Conference, I think, even though we knew that Houston was really, really good, also adds another layer to uh, Samson's candidacy. As for the basketball game itself, if you did not see or hear yesterday, Red Raider head coach Grant McCaslin spoke on the status of Warren Washington, probably the biggest storyline from a tech perspective, personnel-wise, going into this game. He suggested that Warren did turn in a positive direction. So he said in part, quote, I had concerns like everybody was feeling, is this going to be significant? He says, we feel like this will be kind of a game time decision, but I do feel good about where he's headed. As we're having our conversation here on Friday morning, Chris, I doubt a whole lot has developed since that quote was delivered yesterday. But big picture wise, 
obviously a little bit a uh, little bit better than I think some anticipated. Definitely not in a worst case scenario. It doesn't sound like. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll big take picture me... wise, I mean seven foot. Big oh, picture wise, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll take me some game time decision because <laughs> and, and and even if he doesn't play. I get it. Uh, I, I guess I would almost halfway expect him not to, but I, I don't. I don't know. Um, and, and we'll just just because you got to think, you got to think down the road a bit here. Uh, you, you've got a lot of battles left to fight, and it's just. Uh, and this is going to be a very difficult game, and it's an important one. Trust me. I mean, I think if you win this one, you go from like I don't know if they're really a title contender to like no you're you're a Big Twelve title contender and like you have a chance to win the league championship. If you don't win this game, though, it's hard for me to see uh, a, a path to that. So it's not like that you can just go, hey man, let's just let him rest and chill out. Uh, I, I but you know I don't I don't know the, the status there either and kind of but I'll take game time decision. I'll take trending in that direction. I'll take all those kinds of things because as we have uh, documented on this uh, podcast this week, which got some people arguing with each other, we we, we weren't intending to do that. Uh, I swear. <laughs> Um, we were just telling you as we knew things and then we would update them and all those things, but we appreciate you listening when you can listen and all that. But, but thankfully, uh, it looks like Warren's going to be okay. And, uh, Grant, uh, indicated that, but Calvin, you have a, you have a really tough matchup here, uh, and, and going to Hilton Coliseum, uh, what, what's, what's fascinating is, is I, I have these visions of just nightmare games maybe it's just because last year was such a you know a ptsd type moment you you lose 84 to 50 uh it kind of hit rock bottom i could hear jalen tyson's family members behind me going shoot it again just keep shooting and it just (laughs) nothing everything was missing it just was like it was just a uh you were in a tailspin at that particular time when you went up there turn right around and beat those guys like at home couple of weeks ago in overtime though but you're um you've won three of your last five up there uh the first one of those three was a big 12 championship yep. the, the covid year was the year after and you won by 30 and then the year after you won by 27 go figure uh and then you go up there with uh the, the sweet 16 year mark adams first year with like six six dudes uh because you know people had tested positive for the vid and like, I guess they're left back here or whatever. And so KJ Allen is playing like 25 minutes and you only lost by four, you know? So as difficult of a place as it has been, not necessarily for you in recent years now in the immediate last year. Oh yeah. But after that, a lot of success here, I, I, you know, and so, and Steve Prohm got fired in the midst of that. TJ Alzelberger took over there. So there was a transition period where it just kind of rock bottomed and then you, somebody had to pick up the pieces and start over. So you took advantage of that, but still this is a, it's a hell of a coaching job. It's a hell of a team and they're going to play as good a defense as Houston did. If not, if not better. Yeah. Uh, really a, a quality environment you're expecting to find there at Hilton just about every time around, but you're right. There's been some uh, kind of feast or famine there for Texas tech is, uh, you have a Big 12 title you collect, then you have some lopsided losses, then some improbable ball games where you don't pick up the win, but you make it competitive. I guess as we get into the matchup, I, th- this has got to be the biggest key that I know of. First, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. And the sports calendar keeps turning and the action never stops with America's number one sports book and the official sports book of Locked On. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet hits. There are so many ways to spice up any action with their safe, secure, and easy to use app. So get to fanduel.com slash locked on. And if you're a new customer, take advantage of $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet with FanDuel at fanduel.com slash locked on. Official partner of the NBA. They just played Cincinnati. Uh, They beat them by nine. But I'm still wondering, has anybody picked up a win after facing the Bearcats? I know you told us at one point following text loss, um, it was like, what, 0 for 9 or something like that after a team had played Cincinnati in their next basketball game? Yeah, that went to 9-0, and 0, maybe 10-0. and 0, But I, I, that's that's been a 
a week or two ago. I need to go follow that, but boy, that's uh, <laughs> I like your context clues. How about this though? Just to give you an idea of what kind of defense that, uh, speaking of the Cincinnati, that Iowa State plays, I think they forced Cincinnati into 25 turnovers in that game. 25. <sighs> Cincinnati turned it over nine times in the first four minutes of the game. <laughs> and so what? It, it, it's a lot of what Mark Adams used to teach around here. It's very aggressive, though, side defense. And they put a lot of pressure on the basketball. I mean, they it's one of those, you know, whereas Houston, they're just very aggressive and, and there's a lot of size and strength and just playing hard. And you feel like there's seven dudes out there. These guys are, um, it, it's like more scheme, but they play really hard too, uh, does Iowa State. You know, Keyshawn Gilbert, Taman Lipsy, they, they've just got a really good guard rotation with some length to it. Uh, guys with quick hands, guys that are aggressive, and they live off of live ball turnovers. So I think they score about 22 points a game when they turn you over, and then they and they are able to convert on that. Uh, 26 points versus Cincinnati, which is actually shockingly low when you turn them over 25 times that you only had 26 points True. off of turnovers. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I think they're they're like third in the country in forced turnovers. They're like fifth in the country in steals per game. I mean, every kind of uh, top 30 in the country in like what what they allow teams to shoot from the field, like it's around 40% uh, as a team. So all the defensive categories, they, they just, they're all over the, the leaderboard nationally, not just Big 12 wise, but nationally. And so it, it, it's hard to replicate it in practice. Can talk about it, uh, can show it on film, and all that, but until you get out there, it's just like, you know, and, and I think a lot of teams have a, but your guards in this game are going to have to play very, very well. And I think as I heard Grant McCaslin say, key A, B, C, D, E, F, we can just keep going, take care of the ball, take care of the ball, take care of the ball, take care. I mean, that, that's like the, it's in red flashing lights. So yeah. our scarlet same flashing lights. Yeah, <laughs> uh, back to one of those unstoppable force versus a movable object kind of conversations because Texas Tech has done a pretty good job, uh, and really that's probably an understatement, of taking care of the basketball up to this point in the season. Speaking of practice this week, has uh, Darion Williams just continued to make every shot? Do you know if he's like uh, <laughs> clanged one off the rim at any point? Because uh, that's the cat that's probably, from a, an opponent perspective, uh, gotten as much attention preparing for this one as anyone for Iowa State is. Obviously, Darion decides to go perfect last time out in a 30-point effort. I don't uh, necessarily draw it up to suggest that he's going to be back in that kind of range. But I would imagine, Chris, there's some danger to his game right now because, I mean, is he at an all-time confidence high as a basketball player? I don't know what other high points he had had in a prior stop uh, at Nevada or a prep career or whatever, but 30 against the Jayhawks is pretty nice to build on. Uh, bet he's feeling pretty good rolling into this one. Yeah, well, and according to him, he's never had a night like that at any level. <laughs> um, and, and most people don't. Most people, you know, right. hey, man, I, I remember that game in intramurals, man, and we were kind of – we had three beers before <laughs> yeah. we, we played. And, uh, yeah, and we, we, I just could make everything. That was fun. You know, no, but no, this, this is a – this was a – he's going to be on the scouting report. Uh, yeah. And he, he – that, that will be clearly like, hey, don't let him get going. We're not letting him have a night like that. And maybe uh, guys like uh, – you know, Pop and Joe and Chance, somebody like that can take advantage if there's extra attention paid to, to Darion Williams. Because that's the thing about – it's not like, you know, Monday night against Kansas that Darion was like hunting his shot. He was doing anything out of the norm. Um, the, the, these Some of these shots were – which is awesome that he made them, but they're semi-contested. But that's what you were getting. You know, it's just like a late closeout, and he, he'd have just enough time to get a, get a shot off. Uh, but he wasn't forcing anything, and that's what the fun part about it was. Is it didn't? It, it was very pure uh, his, his night. So, and, and he'll play the game the same way, you know, against Iowa State. He's not going to look to try to get going or anything like that. Uh, and so, uh, to his credit, I, I think he just kind of blends in and lets the game come to him. And that's usually when when special games happen. Uh, hoping maybe to get uh, Pop Isaacs off a recent tough stretch. It's kind of amazing to see what they've even done over the last couple of games with him as a uh, single-digit score. Nothing coming easy for Pop. Uh, and that won't last. last. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that won't last. Well, and each time he's pulling the trigger, even against Kansas, I'm like, yeah, 
I'm, I mean, call me Jalen Tyson's family. I'm like, shoot it again. Shoot it again. <laughs> right. Shoot your way out of it. That's the only way we know for uh, old pop. What else in the Big 12 Conference has gotten your attention this weekend, Chris? Tech and Iowa State are the early tip off at 11 o'clock. Also at 11, it's Texas Christian in Manhattan against K-State. Uh, the aforementioned Kelvin Sampson gets the Longhorns there in Houston. BYU on the road against Oklahoma State. <laughs> Poor Mike Boynton. <laughs> these five stars these days don't have brothers to hire. Mike Boynton, very sad, I guess, this week for some reason. Kansas visits Oklahoma. Cincinnati on the road in Orlando to take on UCF. And Baylor is in Morgantown uh, to hook up with the Mountaineers. What else is at the top of your list? Well, yeah, the, the in order, just a brief comment on, on some of these games. But TCU, Kansas State. But Kansas State, if they don't hold, hold serve at home, you know, they, they drop two games below 500 in the league standings. And TCU... Uh, is headed to your place next, but that's a tough little two-game stretch headed to Manhattan, Kansas, and the Lubbock, Texas. But yeah, I'll be interested in that one just because you get TCU on Tuesday night here in Lubbock. Texas and Houston. So Iowa State and Houston have tricky home games uh, on on this day with you know, knowing that they'll, they will face each other on Monday night in Houston. So that is you know interesting to note because obviously Texas and Texas Tech are both good enough to, to beat these teams. Um, I think uh, I think the Cincinnati Central Florida game is y- you kind of start to look at it. I don't want to like call it like some sort of uh, elimination game, but y- you know th- these two teams desperately need a win. They're both kind of bubble ish. Uh, they're both kind of been reeling lately, and uh, they both need to. You know, they would both really need to win this one. And then Kansas and Oklahoma somebody's staring at a two game losing streak, whoever drops this one. Uh, and, you know, Kansas, they're, they're, uh, y- you know, there's some panic there. Is McCullough going to play? Oklahoma is, is lost one of their guys uh, too on, on Saturday. I mean, excuse me, this past week, I don't think he'll play on the Suarez, I think is, is who got hurt in, uh, uh, in Waco earlier this week. So, I mean, like that's a game of like who, who's actually playing and who's not. Uh, and 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 either team desperately needs the the player that has been missing. So, uh, and then Baylor West Virginia, you know, you're going to have to go to Morgantown. I guess it would be in about two weeks. And you, you look at that West Virginia record, eight and sixteen, but they have been pretty good at home lately. I just don't know how long they will hang in there, or they start looking for what's next for them with with an interim coach that you know, is, is unlikely to be back and, and everybody starts kind of scrambling and not really all in on, on finishing the task. So, but they've been really good at home. So Baylor uh, need, needs to be uh, careful there, but it, it's another, you know, big time day of college basketball. That's for sure. Yeah. Kind of curious. Uh, Kansas, Oklahoma has got my attention, I guess. Oklahoma has, I don't know, I guess been written off at various points by myself or others. And then still kind of hung around. They're still a top 25 basketball team at this point. And uh, a win over Kansas, always good for anyone, but should be another action-packed weekend in the Big 12 Conference, beginning with Red Raiders and Cyclones. 11 o'clock tip from Hilton Coliseum. All right, let's pivot before we're out of here and get to a football conversation as Texas Tech apparently has tabbed their man to lead the offensive line. First, today's episode brought to you by Game Time. And you shouldn't have to sweat it out when buying tickets to your favorite events. And with Game Time, you never will because it's always a breeze using the Game Time app where you're going to find killer last minute deals, views from every seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it begins, which means Game Time is the place to find last minute seats to any event. Game Time also the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets, but not just fast. Also secure and simple to use. So right now, download the Game Time app and create an account and use our promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Again, download the Game Time app today and use the promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Last minute tickets at the lowest price, guaranteed with Game Time. Chris, we talked earlier in the week about a couple of guys. One of those. This man, Clay McGuire, we mentioned he and Chris Thompson emerging uh, emerging as candidates early in the week. And then you begin to see some national reports yesterday that it would indeed be Clay McGuire who is headed back to Lubbock. Obviously, a lot of familiarity with this program as a player and coach, familiarity with the state and these recruiting grounds, so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of reasons it would appear as to why this could be a good fit. 
Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I, I thought it was funny because like the the tweet uh, was getting passed around, and if you didn't look close enough, you were like, "Oh wow," you know. Uh, but it, it was from 2018, and it's like, "Welcome home, Clay McGuire, been hired as the co-offensive coordinator," and on and on. But it was it was a uh, you know <laughs> yeah. uh, you know it was an old you know so that they can they can redo the the welcome home um, you know tweet again. Uh, but yeah, Clay Clay's you know, known so many people around here and, and so many of the Mike Leach components because he's a Mike guy, period. Uh, he was Mike Leach's very first commitment when Mike took over as head coach here. I believe that is right. He was ver- Mike's very first uh, verbal commitment from Crane, Texas. Uh, and he was kind of that H-back uh, role, like kind of fullback, kind of tight end, kind of special teams, kind of a little bit of everything. He's just a football player, and Clay's been in this uh, in this space for many, many years. Uh, really, since he left his playing days, he's coached offensive line at USC, at Texas State, uh, at Washington State, multiple stints, and I believe now it's going to be Texas Tech multiple stints. I don't know if he ever co- actually coached the offensive line here. It was more uh, tight ends and, and some other things, but um, – you know, so he he has been involved with the offensive line here, but he he's just got a lot of years invested. Um, it, it, it is also worth noting that I mentioned the the Mike Leach you know relationship, but that's why so many of these guys like you know, because I mean think about all the dudes that have been up at Washington State from your 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 Tech family. I mean Eric Morris, Joe Falani, Antonio Huffman, uh, Darcel McBath. Uh, obviously, we know about Coach McGuire. Dave Emmerich, who I knew was here and is Lincoln Riley's chief of staff, was up there for, for several years in Pullman. And so that that's why, you know, this Washington State, Texas Tech thing kind of blends together sometimes because it's all because of Mike. And, you know, I, I think the other thing to note about Cody, though, is that it's, excuse me, Clay, 40 and slip, but it's <laughs> Cody, uh, Cody Campbell Field. I think is that there, there's like a, in that on the turf? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that, that, you know, Regent, uh, big time donor for the south end of the end zone and all that. Well, Cody Campbell and Clay McGuire were college roommates, you know, when they when they were playing football together for Mike and all that stuff. So it just kind of it, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, so, yeah, Clay McGuire will come in knowing uh, about everything there is to know about Texas Tech and Lubbock, Texas. And, you know, he, he'll see he'll see in a thousand yard rusher. Uh which is yep. not necessarily the norm. He'd be like, man, it's been since like Torian Henderson since we've had one of those. Not, <laughs> not really, but back in his time. Yeah. Uh, but he's got, he, he, he needs to be here uh, yesterday. You know, uh, I mean, you know, time is ticking. You've got all these new pieces. I, I even think they may go get another offensive lineman late in the period or late in the, in the portal window this time, if they find a, another one uh, just to kind of keep, keep, trying to to enhance that room uh but um yeah i'm happy for clay uh i don't guess texas tech at this point you and i are sitting here talking has officially confirmed it however uh a coach uh an agent or somebody has told uh fox and, and espn both that uh hey this is what's happening and they're not they're not going to be wrong they're they're dead on they're right um and so it's a matter of uh minutes hours before you get another welcome home uh, tweet or post. <laughs> um, man, and by the way, included with that welcome home, uh, you've got maybe the biggest job that anybody's got on the staff because I don't know from a position group standpoint, you know, I'd look at the wide receivers, like from last year to this year, thinking, okay, who's got to take the biggest step? Who's got to get, you know, so much better? And I know defensively with so much personnel turnover, you know, in the secondary or up front along the defensive line, there's going to be some big jobs there for those coaches and those guys as well to fill some shoes that are left vacant. But from a year ago to now, I'm really looking at pass catchers in the O-line and wondering whether or not these groups can be a lot different than they were. More so, I would say pass catchers, probably number one on the list. But the thing that they've got going for them, uh, there's a five-star guy in the mix and also an explosive transfer in the mix that hopefully will aid in that effort. Now, you've got some transfers that are in the mix along the offensive line as well, that we'd like to think the same thing about. Um, But I don't know that there's any bigger job needed to be done for Texas Tech football than for the offensive line uh, to really improve. And, you know, every time I talk about that, Chris, I 
I, I feel somewhat, uh, you know, like I, I'm contradicting myself because obviously, or contradicting the reality because you had a great year for Taj Brooks. I mean, you produced uh, one of the most uh, productive rushing seasons in the history of the program. But I think we all understand that you're still trying to be much, much better, much more consistent uh, as an offensive line. So whenever Coach McGuire does arrive, uh, he's going to have a big task on his hands and a very important task on his hands. Yeah, I I, uh, I think it's funny because because you mentioned you in the midst of mentioning some of the right wide, wide receiver stuff right there. You mentioned a key transfer and all that. Well, that's Josh Kelly, who Clay yeah. McGuire is going to be like, "What's up, Josh? <laughs> we, we 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 meet again, same locker room." Um, and and yes, you're playing these same Washington State right. Cougars uh, in uh, in Pullman here. And I guess, what is it, like six months or something? Um, yeah, you know, that's the thing about the offensive line group. You know, I, 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 there's lots of opinions on it. I'll, I'll listen to a lot of that. And that, and that's the, it, most most of them are are fair or fair questions to ask or, you know, whatever. But you think about what Hamby went through last year um, and, and this offensive line group. And, and Clay takes over a, a semi-new group. And it's new for a reason because the players – you know, previously or either moving on or, or didn't come back, weren't invited back or whatever, but you, you needed a bit of a reset uh, and, and all that. But I mean, when you think about it, you, you, you really changed who you were as an offense uh, and specifically offensive line. Uh, and, and Taj deserves a, a, a ton of credit for his numbers, but that offensive line deserves some credit too. The, the staff deserves some credit for helping, basically change what they were midstream because of quarterback injuries uh, because of, okay, let, let's, we've identified what this group is good at. Let's emphasize it. Uh, and, and they were never like great in any one thing, but to, to, you know, and so I think, and that's the part that makes you nervous about clay getting here. It's going to be mid, mid to late February now is that he doesn't, you know, there, there's a lot of, okay, where, where are you best, uh, a, a, you know, a good fit at? Or where, you know, but just there's a lot of scheme and, and personnel and, you know, thought processes that need to, but I think Clay and, and uh, Zach Kitley uh, know each other, uh, have known each other. That will speed up that process, just like Zach and Hamby knew each other. Um, so, you know, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting because, for everybody that kind of talks about the offensive line struggling, and it did, you can't forget the, what you just mentioned about you did have a big-time running game and a big-time running back. And at some point, the guys up front, an injured group up front, mind you, uh, a very injured group up front uh, at times, you know, deserve some credit there. Uh, so, and you know, and and uh, and the staff putting them in those positions uh, deserve some credit too. But, uh, yeah, but this is – there's so much – emphasis on this position because as we have talked about it doesn't matter what else is going on transfer wide receiver five star you get your quarterbacks playing better his shoulder feels better if, if you can't get it done up front you know and that's the scary part yeah and i don't it's it's hard to say it's a benefit i guess but somehow i guess the fact that uh, you have had some turnover there among those guys and among the personnel and some newcomers uh maybe does give coach mcguire a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a clean slate to work with. There, there are some holdovers that are mainstays, obviously, but you're going to have, I mean, for the most part, a revamped offensive line personnel-wise, regardless of whether or not you change coaches. It, it, I mean, really, it's, um, you know, because you've, you've got Caleb Rogers, you've got Ty Buchanan, you've got a couple of guys named like Dalton Merriman and Caleb Rodkey that, that, you know, that didn't, didn't play a ton last year. Uh, hardly ever a uh, Buchanan and, and Rogers obviously did. Um, and then you got the four transfer portal guys, you know, from middle Tennessee, from Toledo, from Memphis, from the junior college out in California. Uh, and, and, you know, th then you're like, okay, can one of these freshmen like a Caden Carr, can a Daniel Sill, can a Nick Fadig, can any of these dudes kind of push their way through. But uh, it, it's a lot to try to gel together and gel together really quickly. And it yeah. means everything. It's probably a good thing you're not playing like top ten rank Oregon and and uh, Eugene out of the gate because you're not going to have this <laughs> stuff really figured out yet. Um, you've got Baron figured out, you've got Taj figured out, you, you've got some of the wide receiver pieces figured out. And speaking of, 
you know, you were talking about Josh Kelly being a big time transfer a while ago. And then you obviously mentioned Micah Hudson, the, the, the five star. But you will hear a lot of good things about, I think, Caleb Douglas is his name, the, the Florida transfer. I mean, yeah. I think there's been some rave reviews about his ability to stretch the field uh, and, and, and all that. So I think uh, they're, they're pretty excited about him, too. So, um, yeah, it, it's just but we got to get this offensive line room correct. And hopefully Clay is here again yesterday and uh, theoretically and you can get, get going and uh, you get caught up and get him coached up. Welcome back, buddy. Fix all our problems. <laughs> Let us know when you get it done. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, good stuff today, Chris. Appreciate the time as always, man. Enjoy the ball game as Texas Tech is taking on Iowa State. We'll be back on the other side of that to discuss it for better or worse. Uh, have a great weekend, and we'll see you on the other side. Sounds good, man. Enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I uh, uh, hopefully a warm trip to Ames, Iowa. It's uh, it's not it's not necessarily my favorite place. Um, <laughs> it, 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 anywho, I, I like where I live. Uh, I, I'll just say that it's cold in, in, in that uh, in that little swath of uh, the the world. But uh, anyways, yeah, we'll talk to you uh, Monday. Appreciate the time, Cowan. Thanks for being with me again today, and uh, I enjoyed being with you. And uh, and enjoy the weekend, people. Uh, Lubbock or Ames, both the land of farmers' daughters. We can all agree on that. Uh, hope you're subscribed. Get that way if you aren't on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. For Chris, I'm Casey. Thanks for being out there, and we hope to see you back for the next round on Locked On Texas Tech.